The second talk that I was that I am going to give is uh, it covers a couple different areas, which is why it doesn't have a coherent title. And instead, I've left the placeholder title that I used when I was designing it, talk the second up. Um, so over the, the last couple days, you know, I, I wanted to start out with the first talk with giving you a lot of you know, relatively uh, you know, in-detail view of how YT, the analysis tool, works so that during the hands-on, you could get up and running with it. Um, and this talk is much more broad, and it's closer to, to what I was listed as uh, saying that I is as presenting on the uh, HIPAC website. Uh, and I'm actually going to cover some things that it was suggested to me that I talk about uh, by Mike and by Darren and by a couple others. Um, so I have four things that I wanted to, to, uh, to share with you. And the first one of those is sort of a broad view of questions. Uh, the idea of asking questions of your data and how you might uh, figure out how you would use a given tool to ask questions of your data and how you might uh, you know, interpret the answers from those, those questions. And the second one is uh, a little bit more sociological and it touches on the idea of collaborations and my experiences with collaborations. I've been involved in two relatively large collaborations that weren't directly focused on a particular science project. And so I think that that gives uh, a, a different perspective on things than you might get from talking about how a collaboration that's focused on, for instance, you know, a given survey of the sky might work. Uh, you know, because there are benefits and there are also problems with being focused on sort of a tool building collaboration. Um, and then the last two sections uh, touch on future directions for YT, uh, because there, you know, there were some questions about that the other day, particularly with respect to getting data in. So I wanted to take a few minutes to, to talk about options for that, where it's going in, you know, I would say the next year and a half, uh, and you know, where the, the possibilities for further down the road. And finally, I have one slide of a YT survival guide that I figured I would leave up during the allocated 10 minutes of uh, question and answer time so that uh, you, know, you, could, you could see it and then have an idea in your head of how to reorient yourself sort of as a compass. So let's start. Uh, with, with talking a little bit about questions. And this is, in a sense, it's philosophical uh, because there are a couple different kinds of questions that you might want to ask of your data. So let's say that you have, you have run a, a large simulation uh, and, and you have a number of things that you want to know about the physics that that simulation represents. And I, I kind of you know, think that there are, there are different types of things that you can ask of that data. The data may be very rich, it may be you know, a little more shallow, there may be many different quantities that you can analyze, there may be you know, phenomena that are occurring that you need to figure out and interpret and uh, you know, contextualize in the context of the physics that went into that simulation. And so there are a couple categories for questions. And these, are, these are the categories that I have encountered uh, when I have been dealing with my data. Um, they're, they're not terribly uh, sophisticated categories, but essentially there are, there are what you might consider to be simple questions that you could ask of your data. There are uh, hard questions that are still possible, and then there are the impossible questions. There's the question that uh, you, know, you may not be able to answer given your simulation or given your, uh, your calculation uh, or, or even given the tools that you have available to you. And so you know, I just want to start by talking a little bit about uh, simple questions and what constitutes a simple question of your data and how you might think about addressing it. And so a simple question is a question where you have both the data that can answer that question for you and the tools you need to interrogate that data. Uh, I'm going to contextualize this uh, with respect to YT and uh, the simulations that I do. Um, and the first step when you are asking one of these is to, to ask the question in terms of the physics that's going on. So this would be saying something like, well, I'll, I'll get to examples in a moment, but this would be asking it in the context not of the simulation, which is a representation of physics, but rather in the physics that that simulation represents. So in a sense, when we do a simulation, we take some subset of what nature does, and then we, you know, we simulate that. We attempt to make a replica of what nature would do in a similar situation. And then from that, we can you know, examine and observe and, and generate answers. And we can uh, better our understanding of what nature would do given those initial conditions. 
And so the second step is to take that question, which addresses something physical, and then relate that to the way that it could be answered given the data that you have from your calculation. So this is um, somewhat harder, in a sense, because what you're doing is you are taking this, this, this understanding. Like, for instance, I may want to know what is the initial mass function of the very first stars in the universe. And when I say I may want to know that, I actually do want to know that, because that's my day job. Um, but what I need to do is I need to figure out how to ask that physical question in the context of the tools and the data that are available to me. Am I able to say this is exactly how the first stars formed? Like these clouds collapsed, you know, they start to radiate when, when they, the stars ignite, they're able to push out gas and stop accretion onto them, and then we have some spectrum of them. Well, in an ideal world, what we could do is we could travel back in time and across the entire Hubble volume and observe every single star and make a notch on a clipboard, and then at the end we would have an initial mass function. It would not be a realization of an initial mass function, it would be the actual initial mass function. But I can't do that. I don't have a time machine. I don't have a, uh, a mechanism to travel between those things. What I have is I have a series of simulations that represent a subset of the physics that goes into uh, forming the first stars. And I can examine those simulations and attempt to, from them, synthesize some sort of understanding. And the final question, or the final step in asking a question of your data is to take both the physics that you, that you sort of, that you understand, you know, the, the, the ultimate answer that you want to get out, take the data that you have on disk, and to figure out how to take those two and combine them using a given set of tools that you have. Basically, you have your, you have slot A, which is the question that you are asking, you have tab A, which is your data, and you need to connect them with the tools. I guess it's been a long time since uh, people assembled those little paper figures that you cut out of magazines, but you know that's where the, the tab A slot A comes from. Um, and so once you have these done, you can actually go through the process of, of asking and answering these questions. And so this requires an understanding both of availability of information from a given simulation as well as the methodology that uh, you will apply to that simulation or your data uh, and the methodology that that simulation or data, uh, you know, underwent. So I'm going to give just a very brief overview with no slides, so you can tell that it will be brief, of population three stars, because I want to contextualize the examples that I have for how I, for a mechanism for thinking about, you know, asking questions and answering them. So when the universe was very young, uh, there were no stars, as uh, dark matter halos of between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6 solar masses began to collapse, they would draw in baryonic matter. That baryonic matter, as it reached a given density, would start to form molecular hydrogen. That molecular hydrogen would radiate out, uh, you know, in, in roughly an optically thin manner through rho vibrational trans, uh, transitions in the in the uh, in the molecule the molecule of hydrogen. As it was relatively cool it was able to shed some of the gravitational energy formed by, or that was uh, gained during its collapse. Now, for a very long time, it was believed that these stars would be massive. You, know, you have a given number of, of, of Bonner-Ebert masses inside a given region. You would expect, based on their angular momentum profiles and the accretion rate, that you could get between a mass of about 30 and 300 solar masses. Um, there has been some recent work suggesting that, no, you probably fragment either into a handful or many. And it's not clear yet the, you know, the, the way that that, uh, that question is going to sort of shake out. Um, and so when I started my graduate work, uh, I started running calculations of these, these stars. We would start with a box about 300, well, exactly 300 kiloparsecs over H, co-moving on a side. And in this box, we would watch dark matter halos collapse. We would allow refinement to proceed. And we would ultimately start to see the formation of this molecular cloud. And then finally, uh, as the molecular cloud collapsed, we would see the formation of the first protostars in the universe. So there is a, uh, I guess, two and a half minute version of how I spent six years of my life. Um, there were two questions that I wanted to answer uh, and that, uh, as, as I was running these calculations. Uh, and the first of these, uh, was because I was running calculations here at, at SDSC, not on Gordon, but on, on Triton, which, was a, which is another that's running. 
And I was starting to see in the formation of these molecular clouds little hot bubbles. These were bubbles of, uh, of uh, dissociated material inside a molecular cloud. So it was all this atomic material. And they were relatively hot and I wanted to understand why they were forming, where they were forming, and I wanted to, to better understand what their, what their long-term impact might be. Now the second question relates to, to a paper that I put out while I was still a graduate student. Uh, where when we watched these molecular clouds collapse, we saw one of them, out of, out of a couple simulations that we ran, we saw one of them break into two chunks. And those two chunks I wanted to understand. Why did, uh, why did this, this cloud break into two? You know, was there a chemical reason for that? Was it just angular momentum? And I wanted to understand what is the morphology of that? Can I say something about that? And so let me uh, briefly discuss how one might go about addressing this question of the hot bubbles. So here is a plot of uh, the growth of these hot bubbles. This was taken from a paper uh, from a couple years ago. Um, over here on the left, this is about 3,500 years before the uh, end of our calculation. You can see the time starts negative and then goes, uh, you know, more positive. And then these represent regions of a thousand Kelvin or higher. And then there's a second contour very far in over here that's 2,000 Kelvin or higher. And this is, this is a couple hundred AU on a side. And so I started to see, as, as a disk would form, I started to see uh, the formation of these little hot bubbles. And these hot bubbles, I wanted to know, you know, are they, are they fully atomic? Are they molecular? Are they going to move up? Are they going to move down? Could they decrease the optical depth as radiation is attempting to escape from a protostar? And so, uh, you know, I, I I, I thought about this in the context of those, those three steps. Uh, the physical meaning to me was there's gas in some regions that seems to be hotter than others. You know, and what, what does this mean for the, the growth of these stars? And the second question is, based on the data, how do I ident identify hot regions in my simulation using only their properties? And the final one was, how do I persuade YT to tell me about those regions? And so the, the idea here is that you want to identify the one red thread, uh, as, as someone has said to me before, the one red thread that connects your entire story. And for this story, that story starts with the, the, uh, the visual inspection of the data and then ends with some sort of quantitative understanding of the data. And so what I did was I started thinking about it in terms of the different tools that are available to us in, in YT. I understood first that the data was telling me that some regions were hotter and they were dissociated. And I understood that by first plotting this image that you see in the upper left. This is a phase diagram of density and temperature and it's the mass distribution. And yesterday we made one of these from a, uh, from a cosmological simulation. And this is one that was made from also a cosmological simulation but one that uh, was much more deeply nested than the one we dealt with yesterday. You can see over on the left, it's a 10 to the minus 18 grams per cubic centimeter. That's about 10 to the 6 particles per cc. Um, and on the far right, it's 10 to the minus 10 uh, grams per cubic centimeter. And so the region that I was interested in was that region. It's not very much mass, uh, but it's, it could potentially be dynamically important. I think there's a laser pointer on here. Maybe not. And so once I understood sort of that, that I was looking at uh, regions of high temperature and I, I looked at the image plots again, I started to see that they were in the polar regions. I moved on to this, to this middle plot. Uh, and this was another way to interrogate the data. And so this middle plot was actually a plot of mass distribution as a function of the y-axis. Oh, thank you. Uh, was a function on the y-axis of the temperature of the, the, of the, the gas, and on the x-axis of the declination from the angular momentum vector. So this combines the, the second two steps. I'm calculating the angular momentum vector, and I'm telling that to YT, and then I created a derived field that calculated the declination of a given fluid parcel from that angular momentum vector. And then finally, together, and to understand how this temperature inter, uh, interacts with the rest of the fluid and could potentially interact with the rest of the calculation, I plotted the molecular hydrogen fraction. You can see down here is the molecular hydrogen fraction color bar. And so very low molecular hydrogen fraction is very red and very high molecular hydrogen fraction is purple. 
and I correlated this with an image plot of the same. And so in this way, I stepped through with my initial question, which I, you know, was, which I gained from a visual exploration of the data. I thought about what this data could be representing, uh, you know, in, and how I might query that data. And then I persuaded YT to tell me that information by uh, setting up the, the tools that we used yesterday, phase plots, derived fields, and so on. And so the second question that I wanted to answer was morphology. And again, I'm going to, to think about this in terms, of the, in terms of the tools that we used yesterday. This is a volume rendering, uh, and this is actually the answer to the question. So I'm, I'm sorry for giving away the ending. Um, uh, later on, I'll spoil uh, Titanic and Dark Knight Rises for everyone. Um, this is a volume rendering of, that same si uh, of a different simulation. And this is the, the one that I saw fragment up. And so what, what, I, what I examined here was I saw that, well, the data is telling me that there is a physical question here. And that physical question is, you know, how does this gas fragment? And the second, uh, the second manner that I wanted to look at that was, well, is, are there any correlations between the data that I could look at? Uh, ooh, there's a sentence fragment up there. Um, at what densities uh, do the chemical instabilities interface? And how do I persuade YT to tell me about those regions? And so I examined the data in uh, another way that was very familiar to us yesterday. I looked at it as a function of rho and temperature. And again, you'll see what I pointed out in the previous set of slides, which is this hot dissociated region. But I started to notice that there were a couple different uh, changes in slope of the average, of the, uh, average temperature as a function of density. You can see right here, uh, there's, a, there's a change in slope right there. There's another change in slope right there. And so I started to construct this, uh, this volume rendering, which was my mechanism of persuading YT to tell me about this data in the context of the physical question, why does the morphology change and why do I see fragmentation, by inserting isocontours at densities that were of relevance to me. And the first isocontour I inserted was here, just to give a context for the larger molecular cloud before any of the kinks in the equation of state take over. And the second one that I inserted uh, was here, where I first saw the change in the molecular, in the, in the equation of state of the gas. And you can start to see that in this context, we're starting to see that things are, are changing rapidly, uh, and, and there's actually a nonlinear relationship. So as we move on further, you can see that inside that second kink is where these fragments take hold. And so in constructing this set of visualizations, uh, which I've used uh, in, in, a, in several talks to, to convey this information, I helped myself understand better why does this, this cloud fragment and how can I contextualize that from what the data is telling me. And so the second thing, uh, the second type of question, as you may recall, is a hard question. And I guess a hard question to me uh, is where the tools or the data are not available. And so the steps that I, that I would go through for this is, again, asking the physical question. All of this has to be driven by our understanding of physics, has to be driven by the questions that we want to answer. In my case, it's formation of pop three stars. In other people's cases, it may be you know, the IMF of, of galactic stars, or it may be uh, you know, how halos are formed in the universe, or dwarf galaxies, and you know, the transition from population three to population two, or you know, any number of things, and cosmological things. How do halos cluster on large scales? Uh, and the second step, again, is formulate this question in terms of the data. Uh, and the third one, which I think is ex extremely important for the fourth one, is asking why your existing tools or simulations do not satisfy this answer. You know, that's, that's an important thing to contextualize because for hard questions, very often you have to build something up. You have to build it from scratch. You have to extend functionality. You have to do something like that. And then finally, you iterate on your algorithms and your implementations. So if we return to the most recent example, uh, when I first noticed this, this, this object hap, uh, you know, break up, my first thought was, well, this cloud broke up. And the second question I wanted to answer was, how do I identify one region from another? Because what I really wanted to know is I wanted to know, are these uh, objects bound gravitationally? Are they bound to each other? How long would it take for them to collide with each other? Is that time lower than the time that it would take for each one to ignite as a star? Is it greater than the time it would take for each one to ignite as a star? And so it, in order to answer those questions, I have to say something about you know, what is one object and what is another. 
And so, you know, the final one is, you know, the, the third step that I, that I came across was that the clouds it broke into aren't regular shapes. I can't just pick a couple different points and set up a sphere around them. Because you remember yesterday we talked about setting up spheres, for instance, in YT. And you could do that in other tools as well, like Paraview or Visit and so on. Um, but so I can't just do that because I want to actually say something quantitative about these two objects. And setting up a sphere with irregular objects can often intersect with other ones. And so what we want to try to do is we want to try to identify connected sets or level sets. And so this is an example. This is the ending point uh, of, that, of that story, which is where we've identified level sets in the data. And then I, examining those level sets, I was able to calculate their binding energy. I was able to calculate their rotational parameters. And I was able to calculate you know, whether or not these, these two objects would be gravitationally bound to each other or self-bound and to figure out if they would form you know, individual protostars. And so the process that I went through through building that tool, and I'm not going to dwell upon this too much, was to sit down and think about how would, you know, how would we identify a connected set. Well, you, you have maybe like a, a volume of, of grids, and this, you know, this same principle applies to Lagrangian codes like SPH. You have, you have individual fluid parcels that can be connected to other fluid parcels. In the case of a multi-resolution code like Flash or Enzo, you would need to connect those across grids. You would need to come up with connection diagrams. And then the final step would be to coalesce all of these. Essentially the process of building what uh, observers would call a dendrogram. Uh, typically with, with uh, simulation data, the, the number of zones that you have to deal with is different from the number of zones you have to deal with in observational data, sometimes less, sometimes more. Uh, but it's, it can be challenging because they're regularized differently. And so, you know, I iterated on that task uh, by first investigating how I might do this just by looking at every single point and looking at them, how I might exploit the connectivity of the data. And then finally, when I, when I started realizing that it was taking far too long, um, you know, uh, with, with another collaborator, we actually built a GPU based code to calculate the binding energy and identify connected sets. Um, unfortunately, the mean time to invalidation of any given GPU code seems to be about two months as new platforms come out, so it doesn't currently work anymore. So the impossible questions. This is a, these are the, the questions that you don't have any hope of answering uh, without doing something drastically different. Uh, and so as the famous philosopher Roy Batty said, uh, all those moments will be lost in time like tears in rain. And the idea here is that uh, you know, a, a, a mechanism or a, a, particular, a particular example of when you lose the ability to answer a question would be during a running simulation. Uh, so I remember a year and a half ago here at, at, uh, at SDSC there was a HIPAC conference um, on the future of astrocomputing, and Alex Zelay uh, stood up and he said, you know, very often when you run large simulations or when you run, you know, when you, when you provide data to someone, you have to choose your questions in advance. You have to know in advance what you want to know from that simulation. Because yes, there's a, there's a lot you can do afterwards with some reduced set of data, but you really do need to ask the questions in advance if you want to have a satisfactory answer. And so the, the context of this really is the idea that uh, you know, we're moving to, to a scale where we have to ask questions during the course of, of a simulation, for instance. And to, to ask those questions, we need, to, you know, we need to know what they are in advance. So an example of that is, uh, so I have, I have an example. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, you know, the, the bon mot that I have is that uh, in situ analysis even can only sip from this fire hose of data. As a simulation is running, every time it takes a time step, the last time step is, or, or two before, or whatever is not necessary for the stencil, is lost. And so you need to ask things as they go. Like for instance, during the course of, of a large Enzo simulation, you might be updating the hydro time step, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands times on the, on the smallest level. And so you can't, you can't really, you know, under, you, can't, uh, you can't always ask all of the questions you want to uh, even. You need to know a subset of questions in advance that you want to answer. So I have an example here. These are, uh, this is a movie that we made from a simulation uh, that we ran on Blue Waters, the, the same simulation we talked about that I showed you yesterday. 
And so it's actually plain. Um, what we did was every single time step, uh, instead of dumping to disk, uh, as frequently as we could, what we did was we dumped to disk a reduced set of, of data. And in this case, what we dumped to disk was a variable projection a line integral through the entire calculation that captures every single element in the simulation projected onto to a given uh, surface. And you know, I'm going to show this again because you know, this was one of the most advanced in situ analyses that we ever performed, but at the same time, we lose information. We can make this movie, right? We can, we can look at it and we can see this and, and we could, for instance, it's, it's hard to see here, but you can see that this is one of the very first halos to collapse. We could zoom in on that halo and see what it looks like, but we're losing two pieces of information. We're losing all of the information that we didn't think to ask about when we started this simulation. So that might be, you know, what's the ionization fraction around this? That, that doesn't happen to be one of them. We did ask that question. Uh, but it might also be, what does it look like from a different angle? You know, what, What's, the, what's the, uh, the detailed morphology? You know, what are the Minkowski functionals around it? Or you know, any of these questions. But we also, lose, um, we also lose any data that might have been found if we had chosen our simulation parameters differently. And so we can't ask, for instance, what is the detailed initial mass function all the way down to subsolar mass inside that? Because it's not answered by the simulation. That's an impossible question. Anyway, I'm going to let this play again. Sure doesn't look like much, though. Setting, a, setting color bounds can be difficult. Oh, no, don't worry about it. It's, the, the color bounds are actually very, uh, very tricky to, to set up. Uh, but I've uploaded these, and I'm going to be putting examples if anyone wants to explore these movies. OK. Now, like I said, the, the color bounds are actually a little tricky to set on these. So it's not going to look like too much. You can see this is during the, the linear regime, and it very quickly goes nonlinear, as these things do. You can see over here we have an overdense region. It flickers in and out. You can see all these other galaxies are there. And uh, if anybody wants to later on, we can actually zoom in on any of these galaxies and, uh, and look at them. So even with in situ, one of the, oops, I don't want continuous. Even within situ, we can only really sip from the fire hose. So this is, uh, you know, a, a slide that I used on Monday of showing, you know, even if we only look at the, the data on disk, you know, here are our data points. If we look at everything in situ, we get so much more. But at the same time, you know, as I, as I noted, you have to ask in advance which questions you're going to answer. Yes, when, when this simulation was run by, by Britton Smith, uh, he asked all these questions of it. He asked about how the gas flows. But there are an infinite number of questions he didn't ask when he, when he set up the simulation. Uh, and that's okay. He chose to ask the ones that he did because they're the ones he wanted answers to. But he did think through and decide that. So the second portion uh, of my talk is where I'm just going to very briefly talk a little bit about collaboration uh, and project collaboration specifically. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of, of tool building, not in data taking. Data-taking collaborations have a long history and understanding of how you know, credit is shared, how people interact with each other. Uh, but it's not necessarily the same for, for more ephemeral infrastructure type collaborations. And I've been a part of two of those uh, in the last, in the last you know, couple of years. Uh, and those would be the simulation code ENZO and the analysis code YT. Uh, and I wanted to share some of my experiences uh, with that. And yesterday, Mike uh, and I were chatting, and he coined this term coopetition. And I think that it's an apt one, because inside both of those collaborations, uh, we have a number of people that are cooperating, and they're you know, encouraging each other. They're providing benefit to others. But at the same time, we're all competing, in a sense. You know, I don't think I need to, to go into this, this notion of the pyramid of jobs you know, with undergrad, grad, postdoc, faculty. Um, but the idea is that, that in a sense, we're, we're all kind of in competition. Not, not necessarily for a given job or for a given set of funding, but also for mind share. You know, it's, it's not necessarily true that, that everyone you know, can have equal, equal uh, mind share. And so it's remarkable, I think, that tool building collaborations can, can function at all. 
but I think it's great, and I, I think that we should try to encourage that. Uh, and, and I wanted to share what has worked for YT. How, how have we s supported this collaboration? How have we supported this cooperation? And, and how might, you know, how, how maybe could you take this and apply it to projects that you're working on? Um, and so the, the first of these, you know, or so, so the four things that, that I think really, uh, you know, sort of bring this home are the ideas of communication, investment, you know, some degree of rewards, and also letting go. Um, and actually, for me, I think that is the order in which they are easiest to most difficult. So, uh, just as a, as a brief idea, you know, here's, here's YT uh, in terms of lines of code with lines of code, comments, and, and lines of blank, which are more common, I think, in Python code than anything else. And you can see there, are, there is a steady process of growth. These drops are when we removed, you know, uh, various different things. So those are, are sort of anomalies. But you can see that there's this steady process of growth. And here is where, you know, where the, where the slope changes or where we started to see more, uh, you know, work on a given project and so on and so forth. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've come a long way even from 2008. Right here is where the first commit was made by, uh, by Britton Smith. Right about here is where Jeff Oishi started making commits. Here's Sam Skillman uh, and Nathan Goldbaum. You know, and there's there you know a number of different people that have been involved. Oh, Stephen Scorey. Anyway, you can pick out. It's it's funny when you look at, at things like this. You can usually pick out where people that you know, you know that have been contributing or where individual account, you know things have happened uh, start start getting added. And so what we found was uh, that we benefit a great deal from a bifurcation of communication. And so uh, what, what I mean by that is that we have, uh, we have our low latency communication. This is our, our chat channel here. You can see here's Casper asking me if it's a typo. Nathan volunteering that it is, in fact, a typo. You know, up here just some information about what's going on in the repository. We have low latency communication. You can see here's a, a Google Hangout where we planned out in detail the workshop that we ran in, in January. Um, but we also have high latency communication. So these are our mailing list messages. And so we have a couple different mailing lists. And this is where you would expect, like, if you had a more detailed question to direct it. You know, the low latency communication is great for, oh, I am stuck right now. I need some help. And so you, you know, you initiate a low latency communication. Uh, and having people available to answer those has really fostered the growth of the community. It fosters social capital because people get to know each other. It fosters people's investment in it because they, they take pride in being able to help others uh, with some you know, speed. And it also uh, sort of fosters this, this idea, uh, or it fosters people being able to get things done. It, it enables people to very rapidly you know, get, get feedback, get help, work on things, and so on. And the mailing list is very useful because you know, from the perspective of a mailing list, we, we end up having to... Uh, you know, having, having longer discussions. And so the idea of investment is also important. But really, um, I don't mean investment. What I really mean is pride. And it's this sense of pride and in, in accomplishment that you foster in someone. And this is true not just for, for tool building collaborations, but also for, for writing papers and analyzing things. You want to, to make people feel, uh, or you don't want to make people feel, you want people to feel as though they are proud of something that they've worked on. Uh, and so, oh, right. I left a note for myself in the slides to show the five megaparsec density video. Um, uh, mm. One second, sorry.
I am going to uh, re-download the movie. <laughs> okay. So this movie is actually a, a zoom in on that same simulation uh, that was made by, by a graduate student at University of Colorado Boulder who will be on the job market this fall named Sam Skillman. Um, and this movie is of the innermost 5x5x5 five by five by five parsec region. And it's a volume rendering of the baryonic density. Uh, and in order to make this movie, uh, Sam had to, you know, work on ensuring that the data kept was kept loaded, work on ensuring that the uh, that it was performant, and he actually took a great deal of pride in ensuring that he was able to make this movie with interactive speeds. So he processed one and a half terabytes of data uh, with a frame rate of something like one frame per second uh, at at Nautilus at Kraken using a volume renderer that that essentially he and I built from scratch. And so the reason that I, that I bring this up is not, is not necessarily because of the movie itself, but rather because this is, this is what I mean when I say, you know, foster that sense of pride. And this is a case study in, in someone, you know, wanting to be invested in, or that is invested in something and then understanding how they wanted to, you know, and then, you know, ensuring that it, that it performed to specification. And it started out by, by meeting a need. Now, I showed you how you could use scientific, or how you could gain scientific insight from things like volume rendering, from visualization. Uh, and that's where, where it all came from. It came from meeting that need. And as our data sizes grew, we had to build new tools in order to be able to study them with some degree of responsivity and interactivity. And so we met our need. And it was a, a pragmatic development. In fact, much of what we've worked on uh, in YT and in Enzo have all been driven by pragmatism. It's been driven by the fact that we needed to answer hard questions. We needed to build out the tools in order to answer physical questions on our data. And I think that that has been a great asset to us because it means that resources, uh, which are finite and scarce, such as resources of our time and our energy and our thoughts, uh, get spent where they need to be spent. And so in 2009, we developed you know, just a very simple way of doing this by, by stacking oblique slices through a simulation. And then we moved on to homogenizing our volume. And in doing so, we were able to cast rays through it. This means making things a finite resolution everywhere, and we could pass rays right through them. And then in early 2010, based on our, our increased needs for, you know, in terms of having a large amount of data, we developed uh, image plane parallelism, where we would subdivide based on, on where the image was located. And then we built multivariate transfer functions so that we could see the way the temperature uh, chain, you know, the way that, that gas changed in appearance based on its temperature and its density. And then in 2011, in early 2011, because our needs had exceeded what image plane parallelism could deal with, we actually built, uh, or Sam built, a KD tree decomposition of the domain. And in this way, we were able to scale to the next step. Uh, and finally, in, in early 2012, we finished our implementation of threading. Because even with all of these different things, we were still busting up against the barrier of having too much data for a, for a given node. And as responsibility and pride grew, you know, development blossomed as well. And in fact, every single one of these was both pragmatic uh, in terms of what we wanted to accomplish, but it was driven by the fact that we had, we had begun to take pride in this and we wanted to see it grow and flourish. And so the rewards uh, system is actually a little tricky because there are both uh, de facto and de jure awards. Uh, rewards for doing things like developing some sort of a tool or, or a collaboration like this. And the de facto rewards are, are, you know, the rewards that sort of fall out of it. You know, the reward of seeing people use your, your developed tools. And that's a reward that, that, uh, that I really appreciate. I like to see that. Um, re there's respect from people around you and from the community. You know, you can get involved in new projects. You know, things come to you like that. You get invitations to speak at, at things like HIPAC. Um, and then there are the de jure awards. And these are actually a little bit harder. These are things like gaining funding for working on a project, or gaining additional publications, or even citations to, to a paper. So these are the, the sorts of things that, that you know, sort of come out of this,
But in general, the reward structure in astrophysics doesn't necessarily favor builders. You know, these, these rewards are, are good, but it's not necessarily true that, that builders are always, always as favored uh, in terms of things. And the final, the final challenge and note uh, that I wanted to share with you about uh, collaborations is actually uh, this idea of letting go. Um, and the idea is that if you build something, um, you can try to control it, and you can try to control the people that are using it. You can try to, you know, uh, to do all of those things, but, but really that leads to smothering growth. And I will share a relatively personal anecdote, which was that uh, last year I took two weeks of vacation. And it was uh, the, the two weeks of vacation that I completely unplugged from my phone, I completely unplugged from everything. And up until that point, I had a relatively low turnover time on getting back to people about questions and answers on, on the YT mailing list. Um, and during those two weeks when I was completely unplugged, I didn't read or reply to anything uh, except when I, when I snuck off or whatever. Um, but what I found was actually that uh, what, what I had been doing in, in trying to help people uh, was actually smothering the growth of the community. And after that, I found that uh, you know, people, you know, during, those, during the two weeks that I was away, I actually found people stepping up and taking you know, new responsibilities. And I saw that, that what I had been doing in, in trying to be helpful was really uh, just stifling. And it was, it was problematic. And this is a piece of, of, of information that you know, I would suggest to anyone who's going to write the, you know, the, the better version of YT that I'm sure will be coming out uh, soon, um, is that you can't, you can't control things. And this is true, I think, for, for a lot of projects. If you control things, then ultimately you're saying that uh, that you may know better than the person that you're trying to, to work with. You may know better than other people who also have you know, valuable insight and opinions. Um, and one thing that we found in YT is that you need to allow projects to pass between people. Uh, if someone starts something, that, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they own it. You don't, want to, you don't want to have ownership of individual sections of the code. You just want people to have, have pride in a given section of a project or a given piece of code. And finally, I just will will end very briefly by discussing some some future directions uh, that we're going to take YT in. In case some of you out there are interested in using it after the the end of uh, well this talk, really, uh, but the the two weeks here at HIPAC. Um, yesterday, the the question came up of of dealing with particles, and in fact, we are going to be uh, directly addressing the problem of geometry selection. Right now, uh, YT operates under the assumption that objects and fluid parcels and particles are roughly regularized and that there is an implicit index in the way that they are stored on disk. That implicit index typically takes the form of a rectilinear mesh. Uh, for things, however, that's not a good assumption for things like octrees, particles, so on, and you know, uh, unstructured mesh, so on and so forth. And so we're actually moving from this concept of grids where you have rectilinear, uh, you know, objects into, a sec into an idea of chunks of a mesh uh, or chunks of a domain. And so in this way, we will be able to decompose the domain based on I.O. standards and characteristics, based on uh, physical location, based on whatever, and then uh, allow interoperation. In fact, that's something that, that Chris and I have uh, scheduled for this week to work on. So with this, this decomposition into chunks of data rather than uh, spatially co-located data, we hope to be able to better support particles. We're working on an I.O. library uh, for what has been called the uh, grid data format, but which I think is going to change its name. Uh, when data gets loaded into YT, it is regularized into a set of objects that all you know, satisfy some given, given criteria in the way that they interact with each other and the way that they uh, exist. Uh, right now, we don't currently have a mechanism of serializing that to disk in a straightforward way, but that is what we are looking for. This library will be exposed both to simulation codes on the C, C++, and Fortran side, as well as to Python codes on the Python side. And once we have those API hooks in place, this uh, library will also handle things like uh, passing data between in, you know, resident processes and memory. And so it will become a library for if you use a library that if you use to write to disk, you will also be able to use to write to other running processes in different processor spaces. So in this manner, we hope to unify I.O. with in-situ visualization. Uh, we're looking at tighter integration. Um, this is sort of the white whale of YT, which is actually generating initial conditions. Uh, what was 
uh, ex nihilo, out of nothing. Um, so the idea is that uh, you would be able to generate a mesh. We have preliminary implementations of this working in Enzo, uh, but not yet with other codes. And even in Enzo, it's a bit of a finicky thing and doesn't quite work. Um, but we're working on generating initial conditions uh, that will then be able to be passed and then utilize a simulation control module to run a simulation from those initial conditions within the YT processor space. This is substantially further along than the initial conditions. Uh, however, uh, neither of them is yet functional. And again, they are the, the white whale to my, uh, I guess, I haven't read any Melville. Anyway, um, so the, the next thing that, that we're really working on is we're working on, on collaboration. And I'm going to show something. Uh, yesterday, uh, if you hit this site, it'll probably throw up an SSL warning, and it's still a little bit uh, flaky. However, uh, we received a grant from Amazon to deploy a data hub on, on uh, EC2. This is the one that I showed the other day where we have the recent projects, you know, all projects. But this also includes things like image collections. Uh, so let's see. You can view images. You can upload images right from your, uh, from your YT command line. They go into Amazon's cloud and they show up here. If we go here and we take a look at uh, my user, here's my Gravatar. Um, we look down here and let's see, oh, what's, what's DD0087? Uh, oh, it looks like I have some simple plots up here. Okay. I have a projection of density. Let's take a look at that. And over here you can see all the different simulation parameters. So this is not running on my laptop or on a supercomputer center. It's actually running on a publicly accessible web server. These can be, the, the idea here is that we want to allow for non-archival purposes the uploading and sharing of data. This is not meant to be forever. It's meant to be more ephemeral. That let's say that I have a projection that I want to share with my, you know, a collaborator. I can just upload that projection and then I can, you know, examine it with them. We have 3D widgets that are sort of working for extracting ISO contours. Uh, so I, they're only sort of working, so I won't demo them here. It is. Uh, so that's a tricky prospect, but you can see down here it gives you the field of view. And so it actually performs two processes. It performs one where it tiles the images, the other one where based on the FOV that's visible, it calculates what the color bar should be. Anyway, this is one method that we're looking at for encouraging collaboration between users. Uh, well, between scientists, really. So this is uh, one of my simulations. But uh, the idea is that all you have to do to upload here, once you have a, an API key, is create a plot collection. Create any of these objects that you would normally create during your process of analysis in YT and then call hub upload on those objects. I've disabled a new user generation for the moment. Uh, we have been plagued by spammers. Uh, in fact, it's been a little infuriating. Uh, but uh, so soon enough, you will be able to generate new users right from the YT command line. And in fact, all of this operates essentially exclusively through the YT command line. We're also working on better outreach, things like tutorials and workshops and so on. These are some images from the workshop that we held in January, uh, you know, people presenting and so on. But also outreach to different uh, communities of, uh, different communities from the perspective of simulated physics as well as simulation codes. And that's something that we've done a very poor job on uh, so far, but I am optimistic that in the future we'll be able to better to, to form long-lasting collaborations with for instance, the Piernik community or the, uh, you know, the Ramses and the art communities and so on. And so I'm going to leave up the YT survival guide. And I see that I planned for a 50-minute talk when I think I was allocated 60 minutes. So uh, I will leave up the YT survival guide uh, as, as we conclude. So thank you very much to the organizers as well as everyone uh, in the audience. You know, I, I've really appreciated meeting everyone here. Uh, and I've had a great time. So thank you very much for having me.
run off into the weeds and nothing can be done. And so who ultimately makes the decision on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable? Well, so, uh, so you... That's, that's a very good question, and it's also very reminiscent of, of what Darren asked the other day. Um, I think that, that the key point here is that, yes, people are free to contribute. Um, and what we, so here's, here's how I sort of view this. People will download the source code to something, and they will do whatever they want to it. Right? Like, for instance, people have downloaded Gadget thousands of times. They have made their local modifications. Uh, what we want to do is we want to have an editorial board an editorial manner of accepting changes back in. So it's not so much that, that, that it's totally chaotic, that it'll go off into the weeds and so on. It could do that on its own anyway. But what we want to do is we want to provide a mechanism of, of a selection of contributions from people who are using it. And so I would say that we have basically a set of, we have an editorial board, so people that are, are essentially uh, through a meritoc meritocratic mechanism deemed you know, core contributors um, who review every change set and bring that in. I would say that um, we don't really have a Steve Jobs. I would consider myself to be the John Scully of, uh, of, uh, of YT. Or the, uh, that, was, that was a joke. Nobody here remember the early 90s? Um, yeah. uh, no, we don't, we don't really have you know, the level of control that, that Apple does. In fact, I think that uh, we're more like uh, the idea, or we're, we're more like, uh, in a sense, um, I can't believe I'm going to make this comparison, but we're more like the Linux kernel, where there are deputies that operate on different subsystems. There's essentially one person who can, you know, that can accept things from different areas, but people contribute patches, and then a selection of, of essentially deputies of, of you know people who have different control over different regions or you know expertise expertise in different regions accept contributions. Um, I guess does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Yes. I did. Those are my goals. That's what. I, those are the changes that I want to make to YT. Well, it's interesting that you say that because most of those goals actually uh, were hashed out on a mailing list thread about a year and change ago where we talked about these different ideas and options. And we, we actually came sort of to a consensus that, yes, all of these things would be, would be really nice uh, and they would, they would be good. Um, the I.O. library is something that, that you know, we've talked about that sort of grew organically from discussions and that people have taken off. And I'm actually not... I'm not leading that project. Um, I, I guess the, the goals, yeah, so, hmm, let me think how, how to better address this. Geometric selection uh, is something that, that we've talked about you know, as, as a community. IO library is something that sort of came up naturally in discussions. Tighter integration is, my, is, is the one that I'm pushing on. But I guess you, you do hit close to an interesting point there. Yes. So everything Matt has described about how YT is being developed and also how M development is being developed in Matt wasn't always this way. I guess it was about two and a half, three years ago, we had a critical meeting of the whole group. And it was at that meeting that I let go. See, I created M development and I nurtured it.
we still rolling camera? <laughs> so that's... Well, so it's hard. Um, in particular, uh, so my current, my current fellowship is from the National Science Foundation. And I was in the, the first class of, of postdocs that were awarded this fellowship. And that is, it's entitled um, Cyber Infrastructure you know, for Computational Science. And so my, my current role is actually designed by, you know, by the Office of Cyber Infrastructure to build out cyber infrastructure for the purposes of, of conducting computational science. And so in a sense, you know, the, the stuff that I've described to you today is actually part of my job description. But finding that balance, because you know, I'll, just, I'll just come right out and say it, you know, science is hard and computers can be relatively easy compared to, compared to that um, for, you know, for, for the types of questions that, you know, or the types of, of problems that I'm interested in. Um, and so it, it can be a very difficult balance to strike because you want to make sure that, that you focus on, on pragmatic building of this infrastructure. You want to focus on building things that are need driven to ensure that you can conduct, you know, the next set of your science. Um, you know, in some, in some disciplines they, they have, you know, legions of, of computer scientists that are working in concert with, with you know, with, with working scientists, but we don't necessarily have that uh, benefit here, and so we have to build, we have to roll our own quite often. And so it's been important for me to try to remain grounded and focused on the fact that I really want to do, you know, I really want to answer question X about, you know, pop three stars or, or primordial galaxies. And in order to get there, in order to ask, you know, interesting questions, and in order to, to ensure that, that the rest of this can all go on, you know, then I have to, I have to you know, perform task X towards building it and so on. So I don't know if that's a very satisfactory answer, but I think the reason that it might be a little unsatisfactory is because I don't have an answer for it myself. Um, and it's something that, that I think is an open question. Does that sound about right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes. How do you get money for paying for the hours that you could spend in coding for other people? So not exactly your main scientific project, because at a very smaller level, I have my own coding project, and I would like to pay that you, for a fraction of my time, that you could be developing this idea. And I found that very hard. So if you do that, how do you do that? Can you give us some advice? Well, so to my knowledge, uh, there have been two direct YT-focused grants, um, and the first one was was my fellowship, uh, which has which has funded me so far for a year and a half, and I have another year and a half to go. Um, and the other one was actually just for a, for a workshop that we held you know, like six months ago. And so, other than that, there has been no um, there. Ha you know, YT has been mentioned in a number of grant proposals. Like, for instance. Uh, you know, a particular grant proposal might say this person will be spending 20% of their time developing, you know, new methods of analyzing X or new methods of integrating tool Y with YT um, and so on. But that hasn't, the, the reward structure is not really set up for this right now. Um, it's, it is a, it's, Something that, that funding agencies are aware of, and I think that maybe people who are more senior than me in the room can, can say more about this. I can only share with you my personal experiences, which are that by developing this tool and by aggressively trying to develop a community of users and developers around it, um, I, have, I have seen a number, of, award, uh, number of, of de facto and de jure awards come my way. You know, I've gotten citations on papers. Um, I've gotten additional publications. That's well. That's not necessarily true. I think I've had two additional publications as a result of the work that I've done on this. Um, I've been funded, um, and the de facto rewards are are actually quite large. Like for instance, um, during this talk, which which I gave because I was invited to come speak about YT, I managed to advertise my research quite a bit. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed that or not, um, but it also you know comes your way because. 
because people start to to talk to you, you know, I've been invited to speak places about YT and so on. This is making me feel a little awkward saying all these things out loud, but you know, it, I have had invitations to go places, um, and do, you do get involved in projects. Like, for instance, if someone wants to do something cool with you, you know, as a result of this, uh, then then you can be brought on board. Uh, like, I've been involved in some some large simulation projects uh, because I've been able to to interrogate the data relatively well uh, because of the tools that I brought, you know, with that, and it's helped me grow my scientific boundaries as well as just you know the the list on ADS. And so I found personal enrichment from it as well. But honestly, I I don't have any good advice <laughs> about uh, how to how to shore up a business model around it. So for me personally, it's an enormous 
probably hundreds and hundreds. So that's not a that's not a ISI calculation, but it is a quantified financial asset calculation. And these are expensive things. So I think the revolution starts with CI, the Office of Cyber Infrastructure, started something. And the question is, 